Hi everyone, we'll give it a couple more minutes just so more people can join and then we'll get started. We'll give it one more minute for people to join. Welcome everyone to our fourth and penultimate session in our Channel Insights series. I'm Claudia Hebden, Emir Channel Director at Keysight for Network Testing and Visibility, formerly Ixia. Any questions you have throughout the session, please use the chat window and we'll answer them at the end. So on that, I will hand over to Eric Floyd, Director of Business Development Industrial OT. Over to you, Floyd. Uh, Eric, sorry. Thanks, Claudia. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, I'm based in Silicon Valley in California. And as Claudia said, I work in our business development team covering the industrial IoT market. And what I'll share with you over the, the next 45 or 50 minutes or so is some thoughts about where network monitoring has a new and interesting play in the industrial market to help uh, ensure cybersecurity and application performance. Bear with me for a second while I master the controls. Okay, so. As you may be aware, uh, we're entering what is known as the fourth industrial revolution now, or Industry 4.0. This follows on from the uh, very important uh, first, second, and third industrial revolutions, which, which happened uh, previously in the first revolution. Uh, mechanization and power were introduced, uh, which created great efficiencies. Uh, but also had side effects uh, related to uh, worker safety and the environment. The second revolution uh, in the early 1900s was one of mass production and electricity, uh, you know, really game changing the, the Model T and the automobile. And again, there were a lot of challenges and hurdles to work through uh, as, as that was introduced. The third revolution uh, later in the 20th century was introducing electronic and IT systems and in particular automation to production and we saw the the boom in the 1950s and 60s uh, throughout the world. Uh, the fourth revolution that we're entering now is known as the age of cyber physical systems and uh, in, in Industry 4.0, we have a fundamental change now where we're combining traditional production methods with state-of-the-art uh, information and communication technology. So intelligent digitally networked systems will enable self-managing production processes and it will improve efficiency and quality. So th that's uh, the primary topic uh, that we'll cover today. And I'll divide into three sections uh, and share at a high level what some of the, the highlights are of the industry trends and challenges uh, from this digital transformation that's taking place in industry. 
and then I'll cover some of the emerging uh, industry solutions. Not only what Keysight can do, but what some of our uh, technology partners can do together. And then finally, uh, what's in it for us? What's in it for Keysight? What's in it for you as the channel? You know, where and how can we capture new opportunities? So let's look first at uh, the, the cool part of Industry 4.0. What sorts of applications are beginning to be adopted in uh, both manufacturing and other uh, industries like warehousing, uh, energy, oil and gas, uh, transportation, et cetera? So uh, borrowed this graphic from Bosch, who are very actively involved in number of Industry 4.0 consortia. Uh, and what you can see uh, on the upper left uh, is automated guided vehicles, or which are like robots, uh, which are particularly in warehouses and on the factory floor, beginning to be uh, deployed to move things around precisely. Then we have uh, motion control in the upper middle graphic. So, uh, going beyond automation and you know really in in real time uh, controlling what's happening in the the various cells of the manufacturing manufacturing line and modular production units uh, so having more flexibility and being able to change within your line for, to meet consumer demand um, augmented reality in the the middle bottom uh, and uh, wireless sensors so both input and output sensing to be able to monitor uh, environmental operational factors on the factory floor and make adjustments in real time so a lot of really cool interesting applications which uh, will be deployed as part of industry 4.0 enabling real-time flexible operations so just to go into one of those uh, a little bit deeper is this concept of extended reality, which is really a, a spectrum of uh, augmented, mixed, and virtual reality. So you, you're probably familiar with these technologies more from a consumer standpoint. Your kids may play uh, video games, uh, something like Pokemon Go, which is augmented reality. You may have done a demo at a trade show at some point on virtual reality, which is more of a completely synthetic, digitally created third world. Then you have mixed re reality, which is in between. Um, but this applies to uh, industrial um, every bit as much as consumer over the, the long term. And I think because of COVID-19, the the panic, or the pandemic, sorry, uh, the, some of these applications are really picking up in acceleration. So uh, think about where, especially in uh, industrial markets where you have a very expensive, sophisticated machinery and you have experts based at uh, headquarters or a regional site who typically would be flying around uh, the world or, or their region to support customers on site. So they're either providing training to uh, the operators of that machinery, they're assisting them in uh, learning how to use it or even helping with compliance um, where there are safety and, and other requirements um, to operate the machinery. Obviously with uh, the pandemic now and the restricted travel, uh, it's, it's a lot harder to send those experts around to support, but the, the demand is still there. So these uh, extended reality, technologies are being used uh, more and more to provide that expert assistance um, remotely. And there's companies like uh, PTC, Microsoft, uh, startup like Magic Leap, which uh, are uh, offering solutions to the market um, more and more to, to do these things. Another exciting application that's part of Industry 4.0 is what's known as a digital twin. So uh, Siemens is one of the players with their MindSphere platform. There are others that have both platforms and software to allow this to happen. But what you see over on the right, you have your real product and your real process or, uh, automation that's happening. What you're able to do is create or collect a huge amount of data 
and push that over into a virtual world uh, and have a virtual product and a virtual process and you're able to simulate what's happening in the real world really go out ahead and, and play out uh, the performance so the, let's take a, a jet engine could be an example rather than waiting to see what happens with it over time uh, when it needs maintenance or when when it uh, will fail which we obviously don't want to happen um, we can simulate th the uh, the performance and the operation of that machinery uh, and feedback to the real product to, and, and the real process uh, adjustments and optimization to account for uh, what is going to happen. So there's a lot of AI involved, a lot of analytics, but at the end of the day, a huge amount of data that needs to be collected and processed and then pushed back to the operational site. So uh, we wish it could be as easy as just turning a knob on a dial to move from one stage of uh, industry to the next. Uh, and, and the term industrial revolution sort of implies that we have this sudden shift. The reality is it's, it's more of an evolution over time. And as I mentioned before, with the previous industrial revolutions, there are uh, challenges and hurdles that have to be overcome by both the end users uh, in industry as well as the vendor community to really get there. So uh, the network having a uh, highly performing, flexible, and secure network is one of the prerequisites uh, to get there in Industry 4.0. So the typical journey that the end customers take, uh, it just animated through, you have to start by connecting many things, or this is where the term OT comes from, operational technology, which previously has not been connected to the corporate uh, IT network to the uh, the various uh, ERP and uh, uh, other systems at, at that corporate level. Um, instead, you've typically collected data on a batch basis, fed it up uh, daily, weekly, monthly, analyzed uh, over time, and then fed back uh, adjustments, changes, uh, with quite a time lag involved. So now uh, you, you've all heard the term uh, Internet of Things. Again, you probably thought of that more as consumer and lots of cool applications in your home or even in your pocket uh, or wearables, things like that. But uh, Internet of Things is equally applicable to industrial markets and, and that's where a lot of the uh, exciting IoT applications actually take place. So first we, we need to get everything connected, then we can start to remotely uh, monitor and control, do things like predictive maintenance, which I mentioned with the jet engine. And then eventually, once we feed large uh, data sets, uh, we can do a, a lot more cross-domain analytics, create a digital twin, other applications um, to really start to optimize and, and change our, our processes, and especially uh, going towards uh, real-time adjustments. So secure connectivity is really the foundation for all of these IoT Industry 4.0 deployments. So we can take these uh, different, I shared a couple, in a little bit of depth, but uh, there are many, many different applications that are part of this digital transformation or Industry 4.0, and we can categorize those into buckets. Uh, and what's shown here, which uh, Intel, who are providing a, a lot of the silicon going into uh, the machinery for these processes, is uh, really based on the, the tolerance of uh, time delay uh, in an application. So towards the left are applications which can tolerate uh, some latency, some jitter or unpredictability in the arrival of packets and they can still operate uh, fairly efficiently. As we move over towards the right, uh, to closed loop control systems and especially to autonomous human guided systems, 
uh, th these become time critical. And one of the main reasons is because of safety. Uh, if you send a command to uh, one of these vehicles or to a uh, production line that it needs to stop immediately or steer out of the way of uh, a person or other piece of machinery and you get a packet loss or packet delay, obviously the consequences are going to be um, fairly severe. So we can look at what the connectivity requirements are for these different categories and then think about which, uh, which type of networking technology can be applied to provide the, the latency that's required, the reliability, the uh, jitter range, uh, data rate, et cetera. And, and so what we see really emerging in a factory or in other industrial sites is um, a, uh, a menu of networking technologies. There's no one size fits all. And uh, as we go out and to the right on these categories, uh, some of the technologies aren't even quite there yet to be able to provide all of the, the requirements needed. So uh, IHS Market, in a study they did a few years ago, looked at you know how the network and the from that menu that I mentioned of possibilities, how it's evolving to meet the needs of industry. One thing you can say about uh, the industrial market is that it it moves uh, fairly slowly and deliberately. And again, safety, security, very high. Uh, barrier or high requirement in this market. So it doesn't uh, change as rapidly as we see in IT when new applications come along. However, it, it does change over time. So the, the green bar that you see over time uh, growing is, is Ethernet. Ethernet as a, uh, a standard protocol based on IEEE 802 uh, be, being adopted more and more in industry. But again, a, an evolution here that you see the gray uh, bar that you see is what is known as field bus. So this is networking technologies that are not ethernet based. Uh, you've probably heard of field bus and all sorts of different buses that are associated with uh, industrial automation and control companies in particular, uh, like Siemens, Bosch, Rockwell, uh, Mitsubishi, etc. So those bus technologies uh, are sort of purpose built in the past for these uh, industrial control and automation. However, there are limitations uh, in terms of being able to move towards these new applications because uh, there's not a lot of flexibility in making changes. There's not a lot of interoperability between the different field bus protocols. So it becomes difficult with lots of gateways, lots of cabling, uh, to uh, to make changes to a factory floor. And as these new applications come along, we, we need more flexibility. So Ethernet um, designed to help with that. At the top, you see uh, wireless, which is growing over time, but still a fairly small percentage of the total networking that you'll see in industrial networks. If you extend the time horizon on this chart, out about another seven or eight years to 2030, you'll see wireless and in particular mobile wireless in the form of 5G playing a much greater role. Uh, but in the short term, while you do hear a lot about it now, it's, it's still gonna be tailored to a few specific applications. So on, on the left in this chart, you can see um, when we talk about Ethernet, which I talked about on the last slide, we're not talking about um, bread and butter IT uh, based Ethernet. Um, these are still industrial versions of Ethernet. So a few of them are shown here. Profinet, which is uh, largely revolving around Siemens and its ecosystem. And then Ethernet slash IP, which is uh, another industrial protocol, which uh, Rockwell and others are very associated with. 
starting to get into the control level of the network, not necessarily all the way down to uh, the different input outputs and uh, devices on the factory floor or in, uh, in other industrial environments, but at least going from the IT level at the top where we, we see the, the screen doing some monitoring and analytics um, down into the the control level, um, you see these Ethernet technologies starting to replace uh, the different buses and, and traditional legacy protocols that were out there. Um, as you can see on the pie chart to the right, it's still a very vendor driven uh, world with lots of different versions of Ethernet or a field bus out there. Again, over time, start to standardize more and change that so that uh, we can support the uh, the cool applications that I showed from industry 4.0 on, on the previous slide. So one way that uh, Ethernet starts to become uh, more powerful and uh, more applicable to industrial uh, networks is uh, through a, a technique called time sensitive networking or TSN, which you may have heard of. This is an extension to IEEE 802.1. It's really about making Ethernet uh, deterministic. So this is about um, prioritizing safety critical or production critical traffic, allowing it to uh, get through ahead of other traffic and really control the time that the packet arrives, which for safety and security reasons, uh, is extremely critical. So TSN uses a variety of techniques, time synchronization, uh, per stream filtering, uh, shaping of the traffic, uh, gates which uh, restrict the flow of packets um, in time windows and then uh, through uh, management and configuration. It's a very complex uh, set of protocols and standards that has been evolving over the last, say, eight to 10 years. Um, but it again, it makes Ethernet uh, deterministic, which is critical for industrial networks. And Keysight has a role to play from the testing side. We have uh, a platform called Novus One, which helps uh, manufacturers to test both their performance and their conformance to the standard uh, before they put their equipment out in the field. And uh, Keysight is, is very instrumental in helping organizations to achieve the, those testing goals. Um, over time, uh, monitoring will also become important because you need to make sure that you are providing the, the latency and the reliability that, uh, that you're targeting. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, wireless technologies also uh, evolving to fit the industrial use cases. So we're part of some uh, consortia in Europe in particular that are working around uh, 5G and its application to Industry 4.0. So what this graphic shows is uh, you can see an access point at factory A and, f and factory B there um, providing really that last mile, that, that final um, connection between the edge data center and the sensors, the robots, the other industrial devices. There are a lot of different flavors of this industrial 5G networking model which are emerging. Uh, which can have the, the data center and the analytics taking place either purely in the cloud or uh, more and more because of the bandwidth required, because of the latency required, or even because of uh, compliance requirements where data is not allowed to leave the, the factory floor and go out of state or out of uh, a region. It has to be processed at the edge. So you're seeing companies like Microsoft and, and AWS, as well as uh, service providers, starting to offer uh, edge services that will either be at a site very close to the, the factory or industrial site, or they'll even be on premise. Um, the, the other uh, variation that you'll see in the models is, is who owns and who operates the uh, 
the equipment so you can have a private network where the industrial company could be BMW, Mercedes, Lufthansa, other companies, they're purchasing their own spectrum and they own, they buy equipment from Ericsson or Nokia or companies like that. They own that network within the factory, but then they interconnect to the telcos network um, once they go out of the factory. Uh, other models where the, the service provider, the, the telco, uh, owns and operates everything on behalf of the industrial company as a service. So that's a super exciting area. Keysight's very involved with all of our activity that we have in 5G. But again, it, it's tailored to uh, a few specific applications right now, and the wired network will continue for the near future to be the, the dominant networking technology in the factory. So how do we engage with uh, the industry to help make this happen? I already mentioned we work with a lot of the manufacturers. So we do that on an individual basis with companies, but we're also part of uh, industrial uh, consortia. And in Europe in particular, we're part of what's called Industrial Internet Consortium or IIC. It has a test bed at the University of Stuttgart in Germany. And what's shown in the picture to the bottom right is a, a demonstrator that shows a, a test bed that permanently resides in Stuttgart that brings together a lot of the, the silicon companies that make either endpoints or switches and then equipment manufacturers that are making either, again, endpoint uh, machinery or uh, bridges and switches, and then we participate from a test standpoint to help all of these companies test their individual solutions and then the interoperability of the various solutions together to do uh, time-sensitive networking and really meet the needs of industrial. We're also a member of, of another group called Avenue, uh, which is partially industrial, but more around the automotive industry, which is uh, using the time-sensitive networking as well, so that uh, cars and, and other vehicles can use Ethernet and, again, have that uh, deterministic behavior so that, you know, think about it. If you're in your car and you hit the brake pedal, you want to make sure that the car comes to a stop immediately. You can't have uh, dropped packets and, you know, occasional uh, delay in, in the, the signal from the brake pedal to the brake. Third group, which we've joined in the last year, which is also based in Germany, is called the 5G ACIA. So th this is uh, bringing together different companies that are figuring out how to apply the existing 4G LTE network as well as the, the emerging 5G network uh, to industry. So we're, we're quite active in a lot of the industry consortium. Many of those are, are really based out of Europe. Um, so for, from an ecosystem standpoint, just to get an idea of who the players are and who we work with, uh, it's, it's a pretty wide spectrum. You see here, uh, starting with the silicon over on the left, companies that are making CPUs, GPUs, uh, switching silicon, et cetera, that are starting to adopt these new features like TSN. Then you have the original design manufacturers, many of them out of uh, Asia, Taiwan, and China in particular, but there's also companies in the US and, and Europe. And then you have the OEMs and network equipment manufacturers who uh, really uh, provide the equipment to the end users. I've mentioned a few times this middle category called automation and control. Uh, in the industrial market, these companies really are powerful. They're the gatekeepers to the factory, you know, to the electrical uh, substation, oil and gas, mineral sites, etc. cetera. Uh, they really orchestrate the ecosystem that uh, provides uh, operational technology, automation, uh, other process solutions uh, to industrial customers. As you go to the right, you see some of the, the more IT type of players who are getting um, involved in industrial. So you have digital platforms and analytics, 
I mentioned before the digital twin as, as one application. Um, these companies playing a, a lot of a, a role in, in something like that. And then you have the telco uh, service providers as well as the new cloud service providers um, who have a, a big role to play in processing and uh, acting on analyzing uh, all this massive data that we're starting to collect uh, as we connect more and more things. And then the final category to the right, I'm going to talk more about uh, a little bit later, but a new evolving um, set of companies that are providing uh, security that is similar to what, what you may be familiar with in IT security, but tailored to the operational and industrial environments. So how does this OT or operational technology compare with uh, information technology? Um, on the left, you see uh, programmable logic controllers, uh, remote terminal units, human machine interfaces. These are you know, some of the, the control systems and devices that we're talking about connecting in the industrial internet of things. Uh, and what you find is these are extremely costly. They're difficult to replace. They're, they're often put in to a site on a what we call a run to fail model. So the, the expected uh, life of, of this type of equipment can be 10 or 20 years as opposed to IT, which has much shorter time horizons and you know, a, a much more uh, frequent refresh cycle. Uh, in the OT world, the consequences of a misstep, a, a security breach, can be much more consequential. Not to say that in IT uh, it's not costly and it's it's not impacting to the organization if there's malware, ransomware, you know, other security breaches, but usually that's not going to involve. It, it's going to involve a lot of money, but not uh, a loss of life or environmental uh, consequences, whereas over on the left with OT, if you have uh, these types of issues, uh, it, it can uh, get people killed, it can uh, interfere with the production process and, and have huge consequences to uh, delivery of the company's products, and it can also involve uh, you know, spills and, and other impact uh, to the environment. So. OT, as I said earlier, it, it tends to be much more conservative in adopting new technologies. It has to be because it has compliance and regulatory requirements uh, to ensure uh, safety and reliability, um, both to employees uh, and to the surrounding communities. So cybersecurity, extremely important. Uh, reliability, the lifetime, uh, risk and fault tolerance, etc. So big differences between IT and OT. Um, the uh, threat of cybersecurity breaches and attacks uh, is not just theoretical to the industrial world. Uh, what we've seen over the last 10 years or so, and unfortunately with increasing frequency, is a, a number of attacks that are designed specifically for industrial environments. And while the average cost is uh, estimated at $1.7 million for a cyber attack, you can see in the table to the left that there have been some, some very expensive, you know, approaching $1 billion attacks carried out on some different uh, industrial organizations. Uh, so you've probably heard of WannaCry, uh, not Petya. There's all sorts of clever names for different attacks that have been designed for the industrial environment. And needless to say, uh, there there's a, a growing threat even during the pandemic. Uh, some of the cyber criminal or nation state actors have been taking advantage of, uh, of people's goodwill and sending phishing attacks which uh, pretend to be COVID related and, and then are really just trying to infiltrate uh, industrial organization systems. Uh, so where can the industrial organization's uh, network be attacked? Uh, unfortunately at several 
different levels. Um, so I attended Rockwell Automation's uh, Automation Fair last November and attended their cybersecurity session. Borrowed this slide from uh, Rockwell, who who know uh, an awful lot about what's happening in in the factory and other industrial sites. And they categorize here. Uh, you see at the top the IT network. You can have a direct attack there through uh, phishing. Uh, get into somebody's email and, and then penetrate through the IT systems down to the OT systems as they start to be connected to each other. There are, can also be direct attacks on the plant itself. It can be indirect attacks. You, you have uh, remote contractors and vendors who are visiting your sites, maybe not as much today because of the pandemic, but, but traditionally, they are, and they have either USB sticks or they have uh, laptops that are starting to connect to that operational network to help uh, fix or install something. All good intentions, but uh, they can become a, a threat to the, the network and the system itself. And then insiders as well, uh, over on the left, you see, can, can be uh, threats to the network. So what do industrial companies do about this? How do they uh, secure themselves against these breaches and attacks? Well, the traditional uh, method that was deployed was what we call the air gap, which literally meant that uh, you, you have air in between the OT network and the IT network. You're not allowing those uh, operational systems or devices to be connected to the IT network. Uh, however, this really does, doesn't exist anymore and for the reasons that i talked about before that you either have third parties contractors others who are out there or even your own it people who are out working on systems they can connect um, you want to connect the it and ot so that you can uh, start to adopt the industry 4.0 applications so what what used to work the air gap um, really doesn't exist anymore so there are, you can put in um, a DMZ and firewalls between those networks there are devices called uh, uh, data diodes which are really gateways that only allow a traffic to flow in one direction however those are pretty expensive solutions and you can still have attacks around that physical uh, uh, perimeter the security perimeter that you put up so that's not enough that those are part of the solution but that's not enough so we need to collect data from the operational sites and analyze it um, you can do that shown on the bottom of this slide here through active data collection using agents however uh, that can interfere with the production level traffic. Uh, it's, it's not highly trusted by industrial organizations. So a preferred method is what we call passive data collection. So this is making a copy of the live production traffic uh, and providing that to tools uh, for analysis. You can use um, spans uh, which are mirror ports on uh, switches in the industri industrial environment or you can use uh, taps which is, sets up a, a, a uses a separate port and a separate data flow for uh, analysis of the, the streaming industrial data and what i'm going to focus on largely is that passive data collection which is preferred method uh, by the industrial companies that uh, that we've been working with. So what I'm showing here, and it's a bit blurry, apologies for that, is a solution from a company called Nozomi Networks. They were founded in Switzerland, now headquartered in San Francisco. They provide uh, operational technology security, uh, and they're a partner of ours that we work with. So what they do is they first go out, um, they collect uh, data through sensors that, that they have on the factory floor or other operational sites. And, and they first build a picture of what is actually connected to the network. And you'd be surprised uh, how often uh, industrial organizations don't actually have an inventory 
of what the assets are that are out there that are connected. Um, once they do that, they, so they bring up where you see all these blue icons, this picture of what's connected out there. Then they profile what the traffic looks like. So what are those devices connecting to? Uh, what sorts of uh, typical traffic is, uh, is passing? Uh, beneath those devices and up to the control level, the automation level. And they profile that, uh, build a picture, compare that to what they know about other industrial organizations, and then really uh, monitor that to look for anomalies. Uh, so while IT has a lot of solutions out there, a lot of companies that, that do this in the IT environment, OT uh, has very different um, patterns of behavior very different types of devices that are connected. So you have a, a specialist group of companies that's emerged uh, to focus specifically on this space. And Nozomi is, is one of those. Uh, and again, a, a very good partner with Keysight. So where does Keysight come in? Um, we've been working with organizations uh, in different industrial sectors especially in manufacturing transportation energy utilities starting to get into some of the smart cities or connected cities uh, projects around the world we have uh, our taps uh, both copper and fiber and, and then aggregation to pull together uh, multiple connections out to uh, switches in the industrial environment and then we also have network packet brokers which aggregate filter uh, and analyze that data um, so we uh, partner with these companies that i mentioned like nozomi here are some of the others uh, in the market uh, uh, to enhance their solution uh, again they have collectors or sensors which are deployed in the operational environment. And then they also have central management console that they feed up to at the IT level to do all sorts of uh, data analytics uh, with the, the monitoring data that they have. We partner with those companies to help uh, in the efficient collection of the data uh, as well as the processing and, and filtering. So, uh, Nozomi is, is one of our partners. We also partner with the other companies on here through a program we have called uh, Exceed. Uh, and if if you are an, running into some of these companies uh, or if you want an introduction through Keysight because you see them on projects that you're starting to, to pursue, uh, you know, we're happy to make those connections. We, we're part of that overall OT security solution, but we don't provide it uh, standalone. So this is an architecture diagram that really shows where we fit together with those uh, those OT security companies. Uh, not sure if you're familiar with what's called the Purdue model, which is a SCADA level network model shown on the left, similar to the uh, the networking OSI seven layer stack. However, this one has five levels. It confusingly, starts at level zero, which is the field network and then up through the control network, process network operations, and then level four is that traditional IT network that uh, that we're all probably most familiar with. Um, what you see here is uh, taps or spans getting deployed. So uh, at level two, at level three, not so much down at the field network level, but, but down into the factory and uh, industrial networks. Uh, feeding into probes, collectors uh, that I mentioned that the OT security companies have, and then uh, through network packet brokers, which are filtering the data, allowing for um, multiple taps to aggregate into to one location before they go to the collector, or to feed to multiple security tools, which is off often the model deployed by industrial companies is uh, they've got intrusion detection, network detection, um, incident response. So they may be working with um, with multiple tools companies and, and the uh, data that's collected from the operational network needs to be fed in multiple directions and the packet broker allows that to happen efficiently. So uh, a few examples of where we've done that. Um, we had a, a manufacturing customer in the Middle East uh, where 
where Nozomi was uh, providing the asset discovery and the, the network detection and response. Uh, another vendor uh, uh, was providing the uh, incident response. We, uh, in this case, didn't use our taps, but used uh, span ports to collect the data, but our network packet brokers were there to to uh, filter and aggregate the data, and this allows uh, the OT security company to focus more on the analytics, the software, up at that central management level that they do uh, deploy less of their, uh, their probes or collectors, which is, has cost savings for the customer and uh, just allows for a, a more efficient uh, deployment. Uh, electric utilities is another market that we've played a lot in the last year or two. The reason for this is there are uh, compliance requirements, especially in the U.S. after the attack that happened uh, in the Ukraine, which was uh, highly publicized, where the grid was shut down a few times uh, in the Ukraine, affecting a large number of customers. Uh, this is a sector that governments uh, feel is really important to keep up and running. It, it affects uh, all sorts of other commercial and uh, uh, you know parts of the economy uh, if the grid goes down. So there are uh, requirements in the U.S. called NERC, uh, Critical Infrastructure Protection, which the utilities have to meet. And part of the, the requirement there is that they have to be collecting uh, all of the changes and uh, and configuration data and, and archiving that um, from their substations, especially for high voltage. So we've worked with several of the large utilities and some of the OT security companies like Darktrace and Forescout to put taps out into substations and our uh, packet brokers shown here is the E10, uh, again, to, to help uh, those OT security companies and also integrators and consultants like uh, Ernst & Young and others have been involved in some of these projects. Um, what does that look like operationally in, in, in an electric utility? Uh, you can see uh, on this slide, there's there's bulk generation on the left, transmission of the electricity you know, over the high voltage wires in the middle and then being stepped down to lower voltage and then provided out to end users. The substation is uh, where the uh, security requirements often also at the generation level, but especially at that substation, which are you've seen them as you drive around out in your community. Uh, they're often unmanned. Uh, they've got barbed wire fences around them and other protection, but sites that, that really need to be locked down from a cybersecurity standpoint. Uh, this is what it often looks like and where our equipment and the OT security tools are getting deployed is in this little cabinet that you see uh, in the bottom right of the image. Um, so our commercial grade products that are built for the data center or the office environment have actually been able to fit here because there often is air conditioning and humidity control at, uh, at these sites. Another solution that we have in addition to the taps and packet brokers is called Threat Simulator. Uh, this allows you to simulate a breach or an attack um, in a funny way. Uh, we allow you to attack yourself to find out what your vulnerabilities are. We're partnering with companies like Nozomi to add uh, a database of, of OT-specific threats to the, uh, the enterprise and data center type of threats that we already have in our library. So uh, look for this in the near future uh, as another solution that really allows you to not only monitor your network, but uh, to test it in real time and look for new vulnerabilities that are coming out and, and your ability to protect against those. So what's in it for Keysight and what's in it for our channel partners? Um, to wrap up here, uh, as you can see, there's a lot of threats that I mentioned to the industrial networks as they become more connected to support those Industry 4.0 applications. The good news is that there is a, this new market of solutions called industrial control system security or, uh, or OT security 
the network uh, monitoring and detection solutions are a subset of that market. It's, it's growing at about a 20% compound annual growth rate. And uh, what we intend to do is, uh, you know, capture our share of that uh, together with OT security partners. Um, who can you target uh, to go try to sell into this market? Uh, we've talked a lot about manufacturing, energy there's uh you know as many as 15 16 different critical infrastructure uh, sectors that are designated by government agencies like in the u.s the department of homeland security uh not all of them have ot but but most of the ones shown here do and then you can see on the right this is worldwide data but this was just a, a study that was looking at how many operational sites are out there that can be converted to the new industrial protocols or, or 5G as that emerges. And you can see it's a very large number of sites which traditionally were air-gapped now becoming networked. So lots and lots of opportunity out there in the market. Uh, utilities in the US and worldwide, as I mentioned, has been uh, maybe one of the early adopters because of its criticality to the overall economy. So just looking at Europe, you have a, a, a large number of both transmission and distribution uh, players that, that you can target in your markets shown here how and uh, who do you call on to, to get into this market? You probably already have customers um, in these sectors where you're calling on the IT department. That's okay. Uh, you can get intros through the IT team um, into the OT departments. They do start to work together, especially on security. You want to be looking for your, uh, your chief security officer, OT specialist or OT security specialist. And then have some prospecting questions in mind about what OT security projects they may be implementing, what uh, threats, security breaches they're worried about, how do they provide visibility, if at all, today to uh, to OT tools, and, and you know which OT uh, security companies do they work with, and then uh, again where we can play a role. Do you want to save money on those OT security tools by not having to de deploy as many probes and collectors out there? Um, Keysight has a lot of resources that we've started to put together to, to help our sales force, but also our, our channel partners to get into this market. So we've put together uh, reference architecture guides like the slide that I showed you before with the, the reference architecture. We've got customer facing slide sets solution briefs. There's one shown here that I worked on for the electric uh, power industry. Uh, we have joint uh, solutions briefs with some of our OT security partners like Nozomi. Uh, there's more coming with some of those other companies that I showed there as partners. And then we've started to do some uh, in industrial focused trade shows. Uh, you see a couple of them at the bottom here, ICS cybersecurity, uh, we just participated in, in uh, the Asia Pacific region. We did a worldwide show on cybersecurity for critical assets and we've got more of those coming up. And then I've shown a, a, a URL for a website that you can go to on keysight.com to find uh, more information about our solutions. So with that, uh, we have a few minutes for a QA and a and like to give the opportunity for uh, you, to, uh, you know, ask questions that you have out there. And then um, finally, let me put in a, uh, a plug for tomorrow's uh, ultimate uh, channel insight session, which is about improving visibility and security within your customer's ecosystem. That will be tomorrow, which is my birthday, by the way, September 11th uh, at 11 a.m. Uh, Central European time. So with that, Claudia, uh, do we have any questions? Yep, got a couple of questions. And if you're still awake celebrating your birthday, you're more than welcome to join our session tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Only, yeah. if, there's, only if there's cake available. <laughs> Yep, so the first question is, I noticed Dark Trace as a partner, but not Extra Hop Reveal X. Why is that? 
Uh, no, Extra Hub is also a partner of ours, a very strong partner. And uh, sorry that I didn't show all of our partners on that page on our, on our uh, website. We do have a comprehensive list of the partners. But yeah, I was just showing uh, a, uh, a sampling of, of who some of those partners are. So, so definitely Extra Hub uh, is a partner of ours as well. Yeah, another question. Do you have any industrial copper taps and network packet brokers on the roadmap? Uh, that is a very good question. Uh, as I mentioned before, our commercial grade products have so far been able to be deployed um, in a lot of the environments for projects that we've been brought into. We, uh, we are starting to see the uh, demand for ruggedized products as well, and we are considering that. Um, so hopefully we'll have more that we can share with you uh, towards the end of calendar year. But for now, um, we're, we're really focused on our uh, commercial grade uh, products that you're familiar with uh, to sell into you know, office environments, data center environments, et cetera. Okay, and I think that's all the questions at the moment. I can't see any more coming through. But if you guys do have any more questions or if you want the content, we'll be sending these out as the follow up as well as the link to the recording. Please reach out to either myself, Eric, or the channel account managers, and they'll be more than happy to help. So thank you all for attending. Thank you, Eric, for hosting this session. And hopefully, we'll see you all again tomorrow on the last session of the series. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.